Good evening, everyone. Not the best experience, of course. <laughs> My name is Stephen Norris, and I'm the Walter Havinghurst Professor of Russian History and the Director of the Havinghurst Center for Russian and Post-Soviet Studies here at Miami University. The Havinghurst Center was founded in 2000, and it's devoted to teaching, research, and activities related to the former Soviet Union and its successor states. Every year, our signature event, the Havinghurst Lecture, seeks to address important, timely issues related to this part of the world. Last year, three artists, scholars, and activists Sasha Razor, Rufina Bazlova, and Valjina Mort delivered the first ever virtual Havinghurst lecture on art, memory, and protest in Belarus. Recent speakers include Rosa Atumbayeva, the former president of Kyrgyzstan, and Herta Müller, the Nobel Prize winning author. In 2018, the Havinghurst Center established the Lithuania program, which formalized several years of scholarly and educational activities that have been taking place under the leadership of Dr. Neringa Klumbute the director of this Lithuania program, and my predecessor as director of the Havinghurst Center, Dr. Karen Duisha. As part of the Lithuania program, the Havinghurst Center sponsors an annual lecture on Lithuania. The center also sponsors Miami University's Lithuania Club, made up of students with Lithuanian heritage and students just interested in Lithuania. And it's been active since 2008. Additionally, students have spent summers studying in Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, and have also participated in internships with assistance from the Havinghurst Center through the awarding of travel grants. Because of this new program, and in recognition of what was the 30th anniversary of Lithuania's independence from the USSR, March 11, 1990, we invited former President Dalia Gryboskaitse to deliver the Havinghurst Lecture. Scheduled for March 16, 2020, we anticipated the President addressing some of the most significant issues of the time, including the role of democracy in Central Europe, the significance of NATO for countries such as Lithuania, the impact of Russian aggression in Eastern Ukraine, and the rise of illiberal systems of government in countries such as Hungary and Poland. We did not anticipate a global pandemic, of course, nor could we have anticipated talking about Russia's war in Ukraine. But clearly the topics we thought in, about in 2020 are even more pressing today. We're grateful to President Gribeskaita for agreeing to return, and today's event, in keeping with recent Havikers lectures, will take the form of a dialogue between Dr. Neringa Klumbite, President Griboskaita, and myself. But first, Dr. Klumbite will introduce our guests. It's my great privilege to welcome our guest of honor, President Dela Griboskaita, in these extraordinary times um, at the threshold of new history of Europe. Dele Gribovskaite is the former president of the Republic of Lithuania. She served as the president from 2009 to 2019. She was the country's first woman president and the only president in Lithuania's post-Soviet history to have served two consecutive terms. After the deepening global economic crisis in 2009, uh, Gribovskaite left her European Union Commissioner for Financial Programming and Budgets, to run as an independent candidate in Lithuania's presidential election. She was elected as a president in an overwhelming victory and presidented in Lithuania's post-Soviet history as an independent candidate. During her first term, Gryboskaita focused on improving country's economy. During the second term, uh, she emphasized Lithuania's military readiness and welcomed a NATO forces as part of the alliance enhanced forward presence in Lithuania. She also served as finance minister for Lithuania. She was deputy chief negotiator for Lithuania's association agreement with the European Union and minister plenipotentiary in the Lithuanian mission to the United States. She also was chief negotiator for Lithuania's free trade agreement with the European Union. Gryboskaite has a PhD in economics from the Moscow Academy of Public Sciences Currently, she serves on a number of advisory boards and commissions, including the Council of Women World Leaders, the Board of Trustees of Friends of Europe, and she is co-chair of the UN High-Level Panel on International Financial Accountability, Transparency, and Integrity. Um, and these are just part of all the accomplishments um, that we could mention, of course. We are very honored to welcome President Gryboskaita to Miami University. Uh, President, we deeply appreciate sharing your expertise and knowledge on the region and Europe 
We look forward to learn from you in these extraordinary times. Thank you so much for coming to Miami. Microphone. Okay. As I mentioned, uh, this will take the form of a dialogue. Naringa and I have a few questions we'll ask I, I can say here, President Gribos-Kaita, and then we'll have questions from the audience. So watching uh, the photos, I realize how old I am and uh, how much uh, passed. Uh, but uh, the experience, of course, is very different, uh, very typical to our region. And this region is 30 kilometers from the border of Belarus of Belarus, where today Russian forces are placed and firing to Ukraine. That's the region I came from just yesterday. And you can imagine uh, how we feel, what situation in our region is, and in my country also. So uh, why, uh, for me to remember some pictures, you saw was very important during these uh, two terms. Uh, the first term was mentioned about economy, but I will say that it's not about economy. It was about energy independence from Russia. And Lithuania in 2015, the first in the region, in Baltic region and in Poland, we opened an energy terminal. And today, not as Germany, not as Europe, Today, Lithuania is absolutely 100% uh, independent from Gazprom. The second term was security after Crimea occupation. Of course, all emphasis was for security. And I negotiated with Merkel at that time to have German presence and, uh, in our territory and uh, to have defense plans of NATO for the Baltic uh, states. Uh, then I came to office in 2009. There was no uh, defense plans of NATO for its new members at all. And uh, in 2011, we got these uh, plans. Now, of course, uh, it is Enhanced Presence Battalion. Now it's very fast, rapidly. Security and presence of our allies is increasing. And uh, from the deterrence posture, we are already coming to the defense posture. And this is understood by main our partners, including by US, and now we are going towards uh, the defense posture. So that's more or less short introduction. And I am ready to answer to any of your questions and as, as long as you want, I mean, not our, if you need more, please welcome and use the time uh, because I do not know what exactly you want to know. As you saw, pictures, are <laughs> too many uh, and too many events happened and it's not only about the past, of course, it's about today and, and future and you can, can ask anything you want. Uh, usually I uh, reply very openly, very straight, uh, candid. And if you want candid answers, you will receive them. Okay. Well, Madam President, picking up on that, um, the question I think that's on everyone's mind right now uh, with the war in, the, in Ukraine going on is whether or not NATO troops should be involved. And as a former president of a country that many fear could be Putin's next target, what should be done? It's a very uh, long probably answer will be. <clears throat> um, economic sanctions are necessary, but they are not deter from military actions anybody, never in history. Putin will be not stopped in his war against Ukraine and against Europe in general, only with economic sanctions, especially because economic sanctions also have double uh, influence. The country who is sanctioning also will receive the pain. So how much we will be able to, I mean Europe and the United States and the world, to take on ourselves this pain will depend also uh, how much Russia will feel that. But the specificity of Russia, uh, Russia's and East European people uh, throughout the history they have been used for difficulties. And uh, economic sanctions, which we're imposing today, only rallying Russian people behind Putin. His ratings are growing. His propaganda is working. We don't, we can't have any illusions that people will arise. 
he closed all independent channels of information. The threat to be critical against his actions will cause people jails and even disappearance. That's how they manage the country. So that means for us that we are talking about sanctions. And if we realize that they will not stop him, only military, military instruments left in our hands, how much we will let Putin to destroy large European country in the middle of Europe depends on us. Until now, we're only helping with weapons. And already they are killing the hospitals, maternity hospitals. And they, as it was yesterday, and uh, Lavrov today said that it is Ukrainians who are shooting the hospital. So how long we will be watching of destroying the huge European country? It's again up to NATO, NATO allies to decide. Until now, we're trying to soften our consciousness by giving weaponry. And from some, uh, even I think yesterday, uh, today I saw on CNN uh, one uh, representative uh, in the House, uh, one of representatives of intelligence service acknowledging that even they didn't um, took seriously the political and uh, civil readiness of Ukrainian people to defend themselves. And this kind of people are advising your government how to behave. Now we have a story with the planes, Russian MiG planes, who are in the hands, old Russian Soviet planes, are in the hand of Poland, Slovakia, and other countries, it's about 70 planes. And still NATO countries, including, I'm sorry, United States, are stopping from uh, possibility to deliver these planes to Ukraine, to fly and to fight on their territory. We're not asking, and they're not asking the American uh, uh, pilots. They will be uh, using them, them themselves because they know these planes. And still NATO is not able to uh, deliver because afraid, afraid of uh, the Putin's possible reaction. But we were afraid of Putin all the time. Then he went to Ossetia in Georgia. Then he uh, was killing his own people in Chechnya. Then he was occupying Crimea. And now again, we're afraid. Who can guarantee European Eastern flag of NATO? Baltic States, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia. That if Putin will say that we will attack you in, 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 by nuclear weapons, who can guarantee that, again, the West will be not afraid or will be trying not to irritate Putin? I think what we're seeing today in Ukraine, that's the fault of the West. Because we've grown him to this stage where he's allowing him, himself to terrorize not only Europe and kill uh, the Ukrainian people, but to terrorize the world. And that's our fault of West, it's our fault. That short answer about what we need to do. My question draws on what you just said, just going back to 2014, uh, when Lithuania defined um, Russia as the major threat. Now Russia is I a threat to I call a terrorist to, state at that time. A terror, terrorist state. And I was alone <laughs> who evaluate the, their, their behavior in, in Crimea. And I was criticized by my Western and NATO partners because of my open evaluation of what he did. Right, so uh, it, it looks like you were, you were right and um, many I was other not right. world leaders didn't listen. <laughs> I was not even right. I, even I didn't imagine that he will be going as far as he gone. I think he now is, he, he, he made from Russia the, not only terrorist state, but the, the war criminal state. That's what we are facing. And we're still thinking that let's push it somewhere. Let's wait. 
And that's what really will be very difficult to tackle later if we will not be able to stop militarily to stop him in Ukraine. So if you could also talk a little bit about um, the future of Europe now. So everybody knows that 18, almost 80 years of peace and security in Europe has been destroyed. So what future do we face uh, from your perspective? It is more global than only Europe. Uh, he's attacking the peace structures after the Second World War. Uh, he's trying to, to attack the democracies. It's practically the war between democracies and autocracies. And really, uh, open war, it is open war. And uh, we still in the West try to think that it is somewhere far away. But as I said, Lithuania is 30 kilometers our border from Belarus. The Vilnius is 50 kilometers from border. We, on our border, we have already a uh, uh, nuclear power plant. We have nuclear power plants in Ukraine, they could be blown any time as nuclear terrorism. This is an instrument for Putin, the same as he had and used very efficiently the energy instrument to, uh, to making European nations and around the world depending on its energy resources. After Fukushima, for example, Germany decided to rid of uh, nuclear power plants immediately, all in, in, in four or five years, and fully depend uh, on gas supply from, from uh, Russia. And now, who is the least critical towards Russia? The countries who import the most Russian energy, because it's a tool of influence to European policies, to the world policies, to the philosophy is, or, I, or he buys the countries and politicians, or he kills them. So why we do see the poisoning, disappearing of people, or we seeing that a lot of, especially ultra-right politicians in, in Europe, have been bought. What an example is about uh, German ex-prime minister in, in energy uh, boards of the Russian companies. The same was with French, which is not so maybe loudly said, but it was Fillon also, French Prime Minister did the same two years ago. So that's how the West was manipulated all the time and, and agreed to be manipulated by Putin, by energy, by other, other tools. And uh, as long as we will be not able to, to stand against him, he will push us, push and humiliate the West. For him, one of the goals is to humiliate the West, to humiliate the NATO, saying that it is bad societies, um, degraded societies, and his uh, understanding of the world and governance is the best example to follow. And we're allowing him to do this. And this is today with this war in Ukraine, uh, practically, uh, for me, it's a shame, a shame of our reaction. A shame that uh, NATO leaders and politicians are standing and saying that mm, uh, we, we're not able, we, we, we cannot escalate. He will escalate without asking our permission. He is escalating and he will no uh, look for any reasons to escalate. And we are still trying to avoid to irritate him. But it is a war, a real war. It's not anymore the, 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 the movie or story or, or, or possible speculations. It's really the war. He is, uh, from the first uh, week, uh, he started to use the methods which Russia's military are using already 100 years, 100 years from last century. Uh, for, for them, uh, no value the human uh, uh, lives. He's, they're killing not only uh, the enemy's people, I mean, not military, but just civil uh, people, but also sacrificing his uh, own uh, soldiers. Even now, we, we, we saw uh, on TV, of course, that he's leaving his dead soldiers on the roadsides, even not picking them up. He don't care. And what he started to do, 
to flatten, flatten the towns with, with the people and, and houses, flatten. That's how he did in, in Chechnya, how he did in Syria, in Aleppo. That's the method how Russians are fighting. Uh, I don't know who knows Russian, Zakidat Shapkin, who understands that uh, b because they are large, they can use not quality of uh, weaponry or, 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 or military art, but by, by, by the quantity. No, to, uh, it's untranslatable uh, from Russian, uh, the caps. If you have a lot of caps, you can throw uh, your caps uh, instead of uh, army. I mean, such kind of uh, social expression about how they are fighting. Uh, and and this, is, uh, we, this is things which for Western person, after 70 years of peace, after Second World War, is impossible to understand. It's absolutely different. I'm not saying the world. It's a different planet. Absolutely different planet. And the refugees we're seeing now, the amount of refugees, also was one of the elements of plan of Putin because he saw how East Europe, for example, was uh, very much sensitively reacting to the migration uh, uh, pressure uh, from last year organized by him and Belarus, uh, Lukashenko, uh, from Iraq and other countries. And they thought that it will be so uh, sensitive and badly taken by East Europeans. And the, he miscalculated because one thing is illegal migration, not from the war zones. Another thing is the neighbor and real refugees running from the war. Why all Europe opened the borders without visas, with social security guaranteed for 18 months for the beginning. And this exodus of people could be, we calculate even between five or 10 millions. It is even more than uh, after, uh, during the Second World War. That's what Europe is facing. But, but, but people in Europe are open, with open heart accepting. That means also this calculation didn't work. It will be not a problem, neither morally, neither politically. It will be maybe difficult uh, from financial point of view, from organizational point of view, but, but Europe is accepting and with full hands accepting these uh, refugees from Ukraine. So uh, we are facing, uh, I will say, existential challenge, which we are not able to understand until now in full. And then most of our governments in the West trying to push the problems far away. We remember probably the Churchills uh, during the Second World War, before the Second World War decision, uh, to not accept the proposed, uh, from Hitler to proposal for negotiations. And uh, his uh, saying was, if you have the choice between the um, shame and the war, you need to choose war, because otherwise you will receive shame and the war. And it's not about Churchill. I can give an example from Lithuania. In 1939, Stalin made ultimatum for Baltic states that as, again, as now, parallel, as a zone of security, he wanted to enter with his military corps and to make the basis on our territories. Otherwise, he was threatening to start the war with Baltic states. At that time, Lithuania had comparatively quite strong army. But the political decision of the government was to allow Russians to go in and uh, not to fight. What we got? We got shame. Our government ran out. We got Gulag. We got Siberia. And we got 50 years of occupation. So that's historic examples uh, about trying to avoid the war if it is inevitable. We need to have courage to go and fight. All of us. The West. So, Madam President, you're, you've been quite clear that you think NATO should be more involved. Yes. Putin has, of course, uh, threatened the use of nuclear weapons. So how, how can NATO, a two-part question, how can NATO get involved without uh, turning it into a nuclear war? And then secondly, uh, just on Monday, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken was in Vilnius 
and promised that the Baltic republics would be protected should Putin invade. How likely is an invasion of the Baltic republics? And do you think that promise will be kept? I will not go for technicalities, but I mean military technicalities. Uh, there are a lot of elements, uh, including mentioned previously the planes uh, of uh, MiGs uh, who were able to deliver already uh, before. So you can do it in different formats. Now about uh, to be afraid uh, of Putin's uh, uh, um, threats, but we also have uh, nuclear power, uh, nuclear weapons. Why we're not threatening? Why we are afraid of some terrorists to be, and we are threatened, and he is supposed not to be threatened. How it is? Because he knows that we are afraid of war. And if you are afraid of war, you are a weak link. And he is doing and using it against us. Until we will be not ready to fight, he will kick our butt every day and every minute, everywhere. And we need to understand it. Um, now on promises. I remember the moments, a week maybe or two, before the war, before this 24th of February. Every day, Western leaders were going to Kiev to support Ukraine. We stand by you. We stand with you every day, including my president, with Polish president, on Wednesday. On Thursday, the, the war occurred. We again fully support Ukraine, but who is fighting? We support Ukraine. I don't want to talk about Article 5 now, but the more promises I'm hearing from the leaders every day coming to our region and promising to defend inch, every inch of NATO territory, I can say, if we are afraid today of his threats of nuclear attack, why we will not be afraid then he will say that if you not give up the Baltic states or, and Poland, uh, I will threaten you again with the nuclear power. We will, after a month or two or, or six months, we will be not afraid. The courage you cannot find in two, three months, or you have it, and you understand that it is existential or not. That's my answer. It's not about promises. It's about actions. I will turn um, a little bit into a different direction, um, although related, um, and, and ask you, um, while tomorrow is a special day for Lithuania's history, it's the 32nd 30 second, 30 second anniversary, um, uh, that's how many years Lithuania is independent from the Soviet Union and announced its, its independence on March 11, 1990. Um, and it was the first uh, state to do that. Um, so those 30 year, 32 years, if we look back, um, could you speak a little bit about the Lithuania's accomplishments? Years. Yeah, well... Uh, yeah, 30 years is <laughs> long, in, in but, general, it's but for country, it's, it's really it's so fast, and especially having in mind uh, how long I was somewhere. So, of course, I remember all these things, and uh, it was my generation who was involved in direct uh, rebuilding of our country, or building of our country. I was negotiating uh, all the relations from, with the European Union from 92 myself, as the official on, on, on different levels, for, from association agreement, then uh, trade agreement, and then membership agreement. Uh, so. And uh, today I can say that our membership in 2004 in the European Union, we started with our economic development of 48 approximately percent of European average. Today, in, in, after 17 years, it is 78 percent of European average. So that's how fast, comparatively of course, but how fast we have been able to develop not only because uh, of support of uh, European finances, but also because of democracies and our values and our reforms and our people commitment. But that, today it is peaceful, democratic, very well developed, very technologically advanced country, but it is today. I don't know what will be in a week or a month. Because then you asked, and 
we got promises about uh, defending of an inch of our territory. They don't need to enter our territories. We are too small to enter in conventional war. Lithuania is 300 kilometers wide. We can be shelled from Kaliningrad or Belarusian territory with rockets. They don't need to enter into our territories. So if you understand how serious threat is and how it could be immediately fast realized, you can imagine what situation is uh, in our region. As president, you had a meeting with Vladimir Putin, and you also had a meeting with Alexander Lukashenko, the president of Belarus. Can you tell us a little bit about those meetings and what you learned from them? Yeah, it was in the very beginning of my um, entering into post, and, and of course, everybody, a new leader, then you come, you think that you can change and, you know, influence uh, everything. And it was 2009 and 2010, uh, very beginning uh, uh, of, um, I would say, some kind of opening and warmness in our relations uh, with uh, Belarus especially, because he was trying to play between Europe and Moscow. And of course, Putin was curious and interested who I am, and, and maybe he will be able to manage uh, some kind of relations, which I, of course, also wanted uh, to have at least the uh, more uh, objective trade in energy resources, because for us, the price of, of gas at that time, Lithuania was paying, you can't believe, 40% more than Germany was paying. Only because we were not, not submitting into his interests, we were independent, and Germany was dependent. While the gas pipeline to go to Germany was some 2,000 kilometers longer. And my first and only one interest was to talk about possibility to reduce uh, the energy prices. But what I got, I got list paper, list with 13 of requ uh, requests what Lithuania needs to do. And he started in the meeting to read me point by point, read, not talking from heart or mind, read me as, as orders. It was 2010, February. I was in office not full year. I was so offended that he's treating me not as a head of state, but as a head of territory. And of course, I said to everything, no. And it was a very difficult uh, uh, meeting because he used Russian expressive words, at least twice. Untranslatable, no, something about, no, bad, bad words. A swear words? Swear words? Uh -huh, swear words? Yes. Because uh, usually that's how he speaks with uh, his Lukashenko, other partners. He starts to sh shout, uh, tries to psychologically to suppress, and then tries to achieve what he wants. So he tried to use this methodic on me, uh, but uh, I was offended also that he was not so ignorant that didn't prepare himself, even didn't read my file, that I am never be giving in. You can talk with me only from positive side to negotiate or agree something, but never give in. And of course, uh, I thrown everything out of all his uh, requests. Uh, requests were very strategic, some of them. Some of them small, but some strategic. For example, don't build a nuclear power plant, don't have any, any economic uh, and energy independence, uh, built uh, in Kaliningrad together, uh, allow the transit special treatment, uh, uh, take out all um, uh, in the international arbitrage uh, in, uh, questions uh, against the prices uh, of gas, for example, we were in arbitrage uh, uh, in Stockholm. So a lot of things, including small things as uh, Kapavitis as the Russian soldiers, uh, Kapavitis, uh, Graveyard. graveyards, also, from small to up to the, all these things. But the manner how he was doing this, uh, the, the, and I had a choice because after this bad words, uh, you have a choice you, as a leader. 
or you stand up and go out. And all genres of the world are standing outside. Or you give in. Or what I did, I started to tease him. And he was not able to take it. The first, he was not able to at all. He didn't. He is very bad with women in general. He's, he did not know how to talk with a little woman, why he was he having a difficult source of miracle. He was very macho, relaxed in front of me, very macho. Uh, and this also made me mad. <laughs> so, and, and uh, he didn't, uh, he was not able, he, he, even he, then I started to tease him, he, he was all the time reading uh, papers, so he was opening face to look to me, who, how are, what is happening? So, and then, because it was in Finland, and it was uh, before Kiblinuska, uh, uh, before one 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 celebration, spring celebration. I don't know how to Lent. Okay, it was before Lent, and uh, in in the discussions, he said that Finnish president at that time, Tari Halonen, will be uh, cooking him this uh, blini. So, uh, uh, because uh, it was so, so difficult. So, and after, after the meeting, uh, I asked her, how, because she met with him eating this blini, uh, she said that he told it was very difficult meeting. And afterwards, there was no contacts. I was not seeking them. And he also realized that it is no sense to, to uh, because you can, you can saw the attitude in the media of Russian media. Uh, first year, they were not neutral towards me after this meeting. So I'm in a month's time, probably. Everything was negative. For each critical word, for example, after uh, Crimean occupation in, 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 in Crimea, uh, pro after any word I, I was saying critically or defending Ukraine, I was receiving personal attacks in the media, in, in, in some stories, uh, fake news about me, the new biography was created about me, the Fed or, or fourth, I don't know which one. Uh, the book was issued uh, bad in English, translated, and delivered to European Parliament members, to everybody, imagine, European Parliament members, to compromise me. So that's, uh, that's the start of the meetings with these guys. Another one also, more or less the same, so it's nothing to to describe to, to, too much of uh, honor for them. But it was only once uh, with both, and it was enough. I, I know the story uh, that Karen Devisha, who was the director of the Haviger Center and the professor here, she wrote a book, Putin's Kleptocracy. And uh, you met in Vilnius uh, in 2015, unfortunately. Uh, Karen Davisha is not with us anymore, but is that true that you gave the books to a EU Parliament member? Uh, I was trying to, uh, to distribute as much as I can this book because it was for me, uh, I was really surprised. The fact that it is American professor, uh, that she was so well in, inside and so, so qu qu well, the, the, quality of, uh, of um, her studies about the Putin was so deep and so good that, uh, that it was, uh, for me, uh, very much a surprise. And uh, I was so uh, honored to meet with her. And really, why I'm here today, I agreed because of memory of her to come to Miami. And uh, uh, of course, it's a pity that she's not with us, uh, absolutely, because I'm sure that we will be have uh, the follow-up uh, a lot uh, of, of a new book, probably, uh, not only about Putin, but about the region. Uh, but I was very much surprised, really, for her deep knowledge of the region and, uh, and, and the Putin's uh, behavior. So this what, uh, especially from people, not from the region, not originally from the region, uh, really, it is very unexpected even to, to see and to, yeah, I was trying to buy and we were ordering uh, on internet. I was trying to distribute as much as I can. The book then she just appeared, the book appeared. I know we're very much at a moment where we're looking at the, the right now and the near future, but it, it, 
if I could ask you to maybe reflect a little bit back on your ten years as president and tell us a little bit about what you think some of your major achievements were as president. I, I hate to talk about it. It's history. Uh, it's, that's why I asked, says yeah, I thank you. I get to talk. Uh, I, then I was asked even, uh, will I write a book as usually presidents are now retirement, they, they have nothing to do, huh? Just to indulge in, in, in indulge in their, in their selves and glorify themselves. No, I said I never will write any biography book and not book about myself. It's, if somebody wants, let them write. So and I got three bad books and only two good. I mean, positive. And the rest is created by, <laughs> by or, or, and paid by mainly, I think, by Putin, paid, uh, which are against me. But, but um, uh, let's say not achievements, but uh, as I was mentioned, uh, uh, the, the, this floating LNG terminal now, uh, I was very much criticized because uh, then we started to talk about it. Uh, I was pushing government to go ahead and uh, and to, to do it fast and without European monies, European Union monies. Because the European Union, if you start to negotiate the project, it takes about three, four years. I said, we have no time. And of course, it was expensive. Because LNG, it's not just the potato you go to the market and there is a lot of sorts of potatoes. At that time, really, it was no at all a market of LNG as it is now. You pay paying monopolistic price you are able to find, and if you want to find it fast, you even pay more, of course. And we uh, agreed with Norwegian company with uh, uh, implementation of South Korea, uh, Hyundai, uh, and uh, we built it terminal without any economic support of Europe in two and a half years. In two and a half. Years. Even our neighbors, Latvians, were angry that they wanted to build themselves, or Estonians. But I said, I have no time for negotiations. I have no time for blah, blah, blah. I have no time at all because Russians are using this uh, influence not only just to our economy, but, but they bind our political parties. And now, then you're looking back, and, and it was calculated that it is golden, uh, golden uh, price, whatever. But now there is no price for independence. There is no price for energy independence. And now during the war, then we probably all the world are going to economic crisis, uh, gas crisis. We can buy gas not only for Lithuania, but for all three Baltic states. Anywhere in the world, anywhere. Of course, then you in office, there is a lot of things going around, but then you, after some time, three years already, or after 15, even more, so you realize that such kind of strategic decisions, even with the opposition, even with criticism against you, at that time, after lag of time, you can turn your, 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 your head and, and see how important this decision was, especially in, in, in these times. The same with the, uh, with the military. Here, what I'm sitting in the tank of Danish tank, Leopard. Uh, it was not easy to go in and, and to go out. But, and I'm shooting not bad, especially with optics. Without optics, not very good. So, but no, I, I tried to, I never wanted to be president, believe me. I was a professional economist. I was a finance minister, then finance minister of European Union. I am not member until now of any political party. And I hate speeches. So position of uh, president is, you know, a lot of talking, a lot of persuading, a lot of speeches about everything. And I never wanted. But in 2009, we got economic crisis, and I felt that it is my responsibility to help government to, to stand up against. And I was sure that I will never go for the second term. But then Putin occupied Crimea. And absolutely it was clear that our armies are not at all prepared for defense. We have no subscription. It was abolished. Our people didn't want to go to army. And my duty was to increase our army, to increase prepared reserve, 
and to prepare country for defense and to influence the opinions of our young people to go to army. So we restored par partial uh, conscription, not uh, for everybody, but uh, and three first years during my uh, being in office, it was voluntary. The young people were going to army without any enforcement. It was uh, patriotic uh, understanding, but that's uh, I felt as obligation to 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 organize uh, uh, Lithuania's defense as much as I can. So that was my motivation for second term. And I was asked today, uh, already with uh, your professors, how it happened that uh, uh, in very Catholic country, women, not politically engaged with anybody, not rich at all, I have no at all any oligarchs or financial support won two elections in a row without financial resources. And I say why? All my first campaign cost me 150,000 euros. 150,000 only used for opening the internet page of president's elections. That's it. And for some advertisements during the three months before election. Second elections was more or less the same amount of money. Because um, uh, I tried to cut any kind of attempt by businesses to invest into me and then later to ask for some kind of favors. My one of the goals in, internally, uh, now we're talking more or less now about foreign policy, but internally was fight against corruption and oligarchs. And I was clear that I cannot have any relations with monies. And until now, I hate everything what is, I was finance minister, but, but for country, not for, for personally. Personally, I try to avoid any money relations why I have no any funds, <laughs> anything, because it's always risky for, for you to be influenced. So, uh, and uh, in country, Catholic country, women without family, not very active religiously, let's say openly, and I was not hiding it. I was able to win without monies, without preparation, without support of political parties, about 83% of votes and uh, with such kind of support. Even now, after two cadences, being candid, being not very soft sometimes, I still have about between 6 and 65 uh, positive uh, uh, ratings until now. So, yes, it is a strange story, but if you, uh, if you match situation objectively uh, and the situation needs such kind of personalities, of course, they're appearing and they're coming. And I'm calling myself that I'm uh, president or, or politician was uh, 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 not for peaceful times, but for critical or crisis times, uh, for war crimes, uh, for war, war times, uh, because... Uh, these times are the challenges which give you possibility to, to perform and to act and to make a result. For in peaceful times, to be only presenting the nice palace and uh, going to the dinners, I hate this, and special receptions. So, and uh, for me, it is not interesting at all. So, but uh, it happens that all the time when I was in office, it's, the challenges were appearing, and, and, and it was interesting, uh, really, to, to be in such office now Then I look backwards. And at that time, you're doing whatever you can, and uh, you don't think that it is strategic decision. But you use, of course, knowledge and intuition. Uh, for strategic decisions, uh, believe it or not, uh, only knowledge is not enough because you, at that moment, for example, you cannot be able to have guarantees that you will receive all knowledge available and all objective knowledge available. In five years, situation can change. And if you do not have a knowledge base, but political strategic intuition for decision, 
for action, uh, it, is, it is useless to, to go to office at all. You don't need to go to office because it's, you will be only in office but not, uh, not doing any kind of uh, possible result. So for such decisions as LNG terminal or, 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 or uh, military uh, relations, even I'm sorry to say it was in the 2009 then Obama was elected, I uh, rejected to go to Prague for dinner where I was invited by Obama uh, as a protest because uh, the reset policy, which was declared by Clinton at that time, uh, I knew and I had the papers, secret papers on the table, that it was uh, negotiations between Putin and Obama administration about leaving the Baltic states and part of Poland in gray zone, not uh, covered by the defense. Letting Putin was asking possibility to have cover uh, by air defense uh, of Baltic states and, uh, and uh, the part of Poland. And I knew it. I was not able to say it publicly at that time. And I protested and not uh, went to, to Prague for dinner. It was in very, very beginning of my first time. I got the immediate, uh, it was inside my country. I was criticized terribly. Uh, that I'm uh, anti-American. Then I got a message from White House that I will never enter White House only even as a tourist. But after half a year, the Obama administration realized that reset policy was an, an illusion. Everything changed and we finished as a friends with Obama and with Clinton and with Biden. Uh, he was a vice president. So, but I stand against, and I took the the all fire on my shoulders, on my uh, on me. But that was at that time a method of mine. Also, I was trying to expose the problem publicly, taking all heat on myself, not to hide, not to listen, not to surrender, as it is now. For example, I am seeing some leaders. It is really a decision of the United States to go now, confront Putin militarily or not. And the rest of NATO allies are only repeating this without expressing their opinions and what they really think. And it is very difficult for me to see that there is no person who will say publicly differently. And everybody is afraid to take the heat, it's political risk. But if you not risk politically as politician, you will never, never do anything seriously anyway. So, and the choice is always somewhere. And we, as a leaders, and not only leaders, every, every one of you, you confront your choices to make a decision every day. Smaller decision or larger decision, but it is, it is how the life is. And uh, you need to have courage every day to make a decision, every day. You cannot think that if you decide it once, you're already courageous or already right. No, it is every day battle with yourself. Madam President, thank you. You've already given us much to think about. I think we've all learned, too, how you can win an election with 150,000 euros, a website, you know? but your personality. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you need to, uh, to know one thing. People need to trust you. And you never bluff. You never lie. And you fulfill whatever you promise. Always. Why, during elections, I never promised a lot. Yes, because I'm serious. I'm fulfilling even in small things, whatever I promise, I do. And why then I was going to elections, as I was saying, I will do whatever I can, but I cannot promise you thousand euros salary or pension or whatever. But yes, I will go and do whatever I can. But that's it. And people trusted me. So you can use all technologies available, propaganda, whatever, all monies to buy media. But then people are, and still elections are still tele television elections, still. While, of course, internet makes a lot of difference, but still. And if people are seeing you not uh, confident, or your body language is not confident, or the uh, words you're saying are really only promise, you will never win any election. We do have time for some questions from the audience. Um, our wonderful program coordinator, Lynn Stevens, is in the back with a microphone. So if you 
want to raise your hand. We'll try to get a handful of questions answered. If in the, in the balcony, if you want to raise your hand, I will try to call on you if possible. And I will have to repeat the question on the microphone so we get it on the recording. So, Len, why don't you Small guy find also. someone? You, you do need to ask it on the <laughs> microphone, please. My name is Alexei Kapustin. I am from Mariupol, Ukraine. Two days ago, my university was destroyed, was bombed. I don't know what to do. And I want to ask you, what do you think about the future, the future of our country, my country, Ukraine, about the Azov Sea, Black Sea? I don't know. Excuse me. Yeah, I understand. Um, there could be a lot of different things. It could be liberated soon. It could be taken as all shore towards the entrance to the sea. It could be different outcomes. And uh, Putin today is trying to take as much as possible uh, territory because usually in negotiations, that's the method how Putin behaved, that usually the taken territories are really very difficult to push back. That's the history of their behavior in negotiations. But uh, I want to say only one thing. Nobody in the West expected that Ukrainian people are so strong that for Ukrainian people, their land is motherland, uh, that Ukrainian people realized their identity as Ukrainians, no matter which nationality. Even Ukrainians, Russians speaking, uh, are fighting now on side of Ukraine. So uh, I think that such a heroic nation never can be destroyed and never can be taken, no matter what will happen. And of course, we we'll all wish uh, as little as possible victims. But you already had what I said, that partly I am ashamed that we are left. You practically fight yourself. My name is Kay Schaefer. Uh, my mom is Ukrainian, and I have relatives that live in Ukraine. Some have escaped, some have not. I wanted to ask, as a U.S. citizen, um, what can I bet? What do you think is the best thing I can be able to do to help my relatives and help you know, my Ukrainian people thousands of miles away from them? Uh, at least there are a lot of possibilities. The first, probably, to press your government, American government, to be, to be more courageous and to really stand, not by words, not only by weapons, but really to stand with, not uh, with Ukrainian people today. Then on your level, of course, the lower level, it is a lot of funds, a lot of NGOs, humanitarian assistance. Even you can invite some relatives uh, and to fight for the visas for them uh, to come here and for you personally to help. A lot of uh, European uh, relatives are doing this. They, they're trying to, to take their relatives, uh, refugees, and, and even then they come, for example, to Poland by millions. They're spreading immediately to, to the relatives in all Europe because there's a lot of Ukrainians who are working or studying in some European countries. So all levels of possible involvement. Uh, could be. In the for example, we have um, such a, a blue-yellow organization, which uh, Swedish and Lithuanian uh, guy Ochman, uh, who is organizing direct uh, uh, help to Ukrainian uh, uh, soldiers, uh, and 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 he in one day, after he invited to uh, to to receive the resources to public, he got 10 million hours in one day because he's trusted, because he's not any government official. He just so unique that he was able himself to organize from the 2014 uh, support directly to the, uh, to the front line. Uh, and, and he's doing now the same. Even sometimes behind the laws, I mean, you never know how he manages this because especially in peaceful times, sometimes so many bureaucratic restrictions for a lot of uh, support. He was doing miracles, and now he's doing miracles. So there is a lot of possibilities for you uh, to choose what you want to do. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hello. I am Beata Andre Antoine. I work here at this university. My question is about the information war, the propaganda war, the Russian trolls who are attacking the West. Was Lithuania able to win that war? What advice do you have how to fight the propaganda, how to fight the Russian trolls who are uh -huh. lying? We started to feel this uh, uh, informational war as the hybrid war, we called, already immediately after Crimea occupation, after 2014. Uh, and uh, because we are European members, European Union, so we have a, a lot of regulations on freedom of speech and voice and whatever, and we were trying to close one or another channel, for example, for pure attack on Lithuania. And the European Commission was terrorizing us, was asking uh, explanations, whatever. It was very difficult at that time. And nobody was uh, really in Europe at that time believing that, uh, that it is already hybrid war. Cyber propaganda, informational war, that it is a war. And for us, it was very difficult. Uh, we were uh, described as, as with childish sickness after the, we, we too young, uh, we too uh, irritated, we too sensitive to Russia, and I mean, too much. And uh, even before uh, Crimea occupation. After Crimea occupation, they started to listen a little bit more actively, and we were pushing, Baltic states and Poland, we were pushing for, for new instruments uh, for Europe to fight uh, information and cyber. Uh, security, but it was still difficult. Now, who? We closed all the Russian channels. I mean, not all. We, we, we're not closing doors or other independents, but we closed all uh, state propaganda channels. Europe closed Sputnik, whatever. Europe closed, which was you know icon of uh, freedom of speech. Closed everything now. So, uh, Russians closed Western. <laughs> we closed the Russian. The problem is that probably we are if not Warsaw, but we are going into the situation where the Iron Curtain is probably starting to get down. And nobody knows where Ukraine will appear or the part of Ukraine will appear. On this side of the curtain, Iron Curtain, or on another side. And that's how it looks like, slowly, but it looks like. We have a question in the balcony, yes? I'll have to repeat it uh, after you say it. I'd like to get your thoughts on NATO imposing a no-fly zone over Ukraine. Okay. So the question I, is I, about I, whether NATO yeah. should impose a no-fly zone uh, over Ukraine. You know, if we go to the military details, there is a lot of uh, different uh, opinions, and, if it, uh, and even we can turn to definition of fly, no-fly zone. What that means, only in the air, useless, if only, or if in the air, that means you need to also to in, on the ground at least to to to, to fight uh, the rocket launchers and all this kind of thing. So really, it is military engagement in one or, or another form, and for that we need to make a political decision that we are not afraid and we engaging and stopping Putin militarily. And then it's not important; it is fly zone, not fly zone, or or, or you just bombarding their uh, katushas or or rockets. Uh, it's, uh, it's a military technicality. And now I'm seeing this false discussion, fly zone, no fly zone. It's not about the fly zone. It's about are we going militarily face-to-face uh, -face against Putin on Ukraine territory or, or no? That's it. I will build off of Katie's question. There are numerous students here tonight, myself included, who have friends and family in Russia. Uh, what can we do, considering both our age, um, on how we can influence what happens in Russia to stop the aggression and help the peace effort? Uh, at least two days uh, in the war, the channels of independent channels, two, three days were open. And as much as especially young generation of Russia uh, was able to reach uh, the information about the war, because uh, today it is a total blockade in Russia. Even, uh, even uh, I would say, 95% of Russian people do not know that there is a war. There is only limited operation in Luhansk and Donetsk, where Russian or Putin saying that their uh, 
defending uh, Russians in this region, it's Russian-speaking region, from uh, Nazistic uh, Ukrainians. And they do not at all attack in Ukraine, and they do not at all go in Kiev. no. Even today in Geneva, it was, no, in Turkey, Lavrov said, Russia is not uh, invading Ukraine. Russia is not attacking Ukraine. Today, today. And now all channels are closed. But, of course, I, I, as I looked into that, even Facebook and Twitter especially, is finding the ways how to go around. But it's again, it's again. Only young generation who are technically capable to go around and look for information, even then you're talking with, sometimes we're we seeing the, the, the media, then you're talking with all the Russian population. They don't believe that Russia is capable to attack Slavian brothers and sisters, how Ukraine is treated, was treated uh, by Slavic Russia. They're not able to believe it. How it is possible? It is propaganda. It is uh, bloody NATO propaganda. Russia is not able to occupy or to, or to bombard uh, Kiev or Ukraine. It's not possible. That's 95% of population. Now it is not open. Yes, but now everything is closed. And uh, these uh, economic sanctions and fall of rubble and all these kind of things now rallying all population against fascist NATO. They're rallying behind him. Yes, yes, yes. It's propaganda, it's brainwashed and frightened and threat. People are afraid to speak. It's even worse than them during the silent times. As I'm saying, the iron curtain is starting to drop. What that means? You, you understand what that means. We have time for two more questions. We have one in the balcony and then one we down here. We have more time. So. Yes, please. The, the question is about how we can prevent nuclear war. And a round of applause for Alexi Kapustin, who is our language tutor in the Having Her Center. How to stop the war. Okay, I can say. And I thought I was already saying this. You can stop the war by war. Not to be afraid to go to the war. Not nuclear. Conventional. Today it is conventional war. Unless we will be afraid of it, Putin will be absolutely unstoppable and he will go with more terrible atrocities and possibilities and chances for at least some not so far away and not so uh, strong attack, but at least to exemplary uh, test attack. It could be. If we will be trying to only to avoid the war, it will catch us. That's the, the message, what we're seeing in Ukraine. We need to stand with Ukraine 
in the war, confronting the Putin. No, we also have nuclear capacities and capabilities. We also have. If, if Putin will know that we will not use it, he will attack us. That's a problem. Everybody needs to be ready. And if enemy knows that, okay, I don't want to make an example of previous year president, but if you have in front of you unpredictable and dangerous person, and you yourself unpredictable and dangerous person you will never attack this person because you know that you can receive back the same. We need to be ready. We need to be ready to respond. If we will be only ready to avoid and trying to look for the ways to avoid, that's, you will not never deter anybody from you. That was exactly in the Cuba uh, uh, crisis, the same situation. It was also about the deterrence and readiness to use, and the Russians knew it. Americans at that time was ready to confront seriously Russian threat. Uh, Madam President, during the, and this isn't about Ukraine, but during the 2008 financial crisis, you were the EU Finance and Budget Commissioner. And at the time, you criticized EU budgets for being overly reliant on agriculture and antiquated economics. Uh, in your position as the commissioner, how did you work to change that and modernize the EU budget? The main thing was that uh, about, uh, it was about 45 or something percent of European budget uh, going not just to agriculture, but to subsidies to agriculture, to avoid to have market uh, prices and market economy in agriculture. And now it's more or less the same. So uh, the, my, my main goal was to uh, turn as much as possible, more than half uh, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, science, research, uh, and new technologies. That was done. First time during my cadency that the amount of money is, uh, uh, for the technologies, for, for energy, for interconnections between European countries was amount of higher than for, uh, for agricultural common policy. Thank you. But uh, here I want to say that in Europe as in, in NATO, it's not the commission on the science, the member states decide. And uh, your job is to convince uh, member states to turn differently, to change differently. It's the same in NATO. Uh, somebody is asking why Stoltenberg, for example, does that or, or another thing. He's just secretary. He is reflecting only opinion, not himself, but opinion of main allies in NATO. We'll take one final question since the president has said it's okay. Where, whoever Lynn can reach first. No, no but we can take a few people want to. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure if um, people here have seen this video, but there's a video going around from a few days ago of students at, I think, Kazan, a university in Kazan in Russia, where they're wearing black shirts with the Z on it, which is obviously the symbol of the West, I think the Western Military District, but they're, now their vehicles have in Ukraine, and they're in, Kazan, in some mall or some place in Russia. The students are organized. They're chanting. They're, lit they're raising their arms to give a salute and it, in unison, and it's, it seems almost absurd to have a state that is having students go out, raise their arms in a salute, chant, they're bombing Babin Yar, and it's sort of, yet still in the US, we have this sort of narrative that, or this hope that people in Russia, um, the, the population, that Russia will have a color revolution in the next couple months, and that we sort of don't wanna confront them because we wanna almost rely on like a, an innate desire to be free. Um, and I know that you sort of said that you, you're not that optimistic about, um, about the Russian people. Um, do you think there's a way for people in the West who maybe understand the gravity of the situation um, to, in a way, mobilize in a, in a healthy manner that allows us to be, uh, to get our governments to be more proactive and understand that we're not going to 
see them see that sort of descent that maybe some people were hoping for. Sorry if I uh, went on a little bit. Yeah, long. question uh, is uh, appropriate uh, some two months ago. Now it's already old. Uh, how to say aged and uh, not relevant because uh, what we see now it's uh, total uh, total blockade of information from Russian people, uh, the total um, suppression of any rise of different opinions, or all who goes on the streets already are threatened by the law to be in the in the in the jail for 15 years only because standing with just blockade or expressing a critical opinion about so-called only special uh, operation in Ukraine. Uh, so people, uh, then you talk, and even the people not talk, but if you hear it, there are relatives also in our country, Russian-speaking people, uh, just they're saying, we're just afraid. We're just afraid. Even, and plus, you said, uh, young generation is uh, uh, putting the hands and chanting and all this kind of thing, and you mentioned about bombing uh, Babiyar. They do not know that Babiyar was bombed. They do not know that the Kiev is under uh, attack. They do not know mat that Mariupol is fr fl flattening down with all people and, and houses together. They do not know. They, they, they trust the young, they are energetic, they are patriotic. They trust what their leaders are saying. That's what we're facing. Why I said that your, your, your question that p people will rise and so, in, in authoritarian regimes, people are not rising. And uh, what Russia is facing today is new repression regime and, uh, and risk of lives for, for if, they, if they will go out and will try to say what they think. Who was able to run out running? For example, even now uh, to Lithuania, uh, we have uh, Exodus from Belarus, all the young uh, boys uh, who try to avoid uh, be invited into army to go to fight for Ukraine, they're trying to run before the borders are closed. We every day have full trains of Belarusians and full trains of buses of Belarusians. Russians also trying to go to Finland where still borders are open. Uh, or, or for example, it was one day to Georgia, to Belize, it was 37 planes from St. Petersburg. Everybody is running. Who knows what's happening and what you can expect will happen. But you have an illusion that uh, the problem is that uh, in Western, Westerners do not understand or try to, to understand uh, uh, autocratic regimes from our point of view. They do not have electorate basis in people. Electoral basis for Putin is siloviki, it's the structures of power, and oligarchs, not people. And he's keeping power only because he's elected by oligarchs and by who supporting him and by the structures of power, KGB, whatever, military. So, so why, even now, if he will fail in Ukraine, for example, I hope, he will be able to sell it as a victory because propaganda totally in his hands. He will say that he fulfilled his goals. He managed to have Luhansk and Donetsk, for example, and he will never show or, or accept or, or acknowledge that his, uh, half of his army who is ent entered in, into Ukraine is damaged already and that his army looks as Potomkin, Potomkin village that his army is, uh, has no will at all to fight. Never, never, Russian people will, will know it even. Only a very small part of people will know it. And even then, then the relatives are calling to Russia and saying to mothers, to, to sisters, uh, that, that there is a war in Ukraine. They say, it's, it's your propaganda. Don't talk with me about politics. They don't believe it. So, Absolutely old chance or discussion, which is not relevant at all with what's happening in Russia today. 
On Monday at noon, the Having Her Center is sponsoring a conversation with Katarina Babkina. I'll be speaking with her live from Wroclaw, Poland. Katarina is a writer from Kiev who had to flee her home in the first days of the war with her one-year-old daughter and her mother. It took her four days to arrive to Wroclaw, Poland. She's very eager to tell her story because she thinks people need to hear it. You can find information on our webpage, the Having Her Center for Russian and Post-Soviet Studies. President Griboskaita, it's been a very sobering conversation. It's been an honor to host you today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay. 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 Flowers and vase? But I can take flowers without vase. No, without vase? Okay. Okay. Short plate. <laughs> okay. <laughs>